Good day and welcome to the Strong Ambition Podcast. I'm your host, Rylan Qualley. I am here to dive into what makes people ambitious or live a better life for ambition. Anything in the realm of nutrition, exercise, or mindset, because that's my jam. And today I have a bit of a unique guest because this is an old strength conditioning and athletic therapist friend of mine who got into ergonomics. And ergonomics is so important because what makes it unique is that we're going to learn about how do we optimize our daily work environment to get out of pain or to stay out of pain rather, because we spend so much time in the same form. And as I'm at this very standing desk that is inappropriately set up and we dive into why I'm having this neck pain and why my, my seated position isn't optimal. And so this is what he does for companies and he helps people look at their ergonomics of how they're actually lining up their joints and trying to stay out of pain how you can continue to do your work without causing more stress on your body. So it's, it's I think, a, a great episode, a kind of unique episode, because this isn't the traditional training approach. What we do talk about training, we talk about how we can make training optimize our health, given that we're so anteriorly oriented. So uh, Nate Rubin is a really brilliant guy. He was one of my first kind of mentors and a uh, guy I really look up to in the gym when I was in Focus Fitness. He worked at Focus Fitness along with Jody and AJ. And for me, he was uh, definitely someone I always looked up to as he was the same age as me, but he knew way more than I did. And so we dive into a really good conversation. He has some really good take-home tools for you. So without further ado, here is Nate Rubin. Good day, Nate. How the heck are you, sir? Doing good, Ryan. That's awesome. So, way out in BC, how's the weather out there today? Always good, man. <laughs> always good. It's always good. And what part of BC are you at right now? I'm in Nanaimo. Uh, Nanaimo. Nanaimo. Yeah. And and it, and that's uh that's more close to the coast itself. That is, yeah, Vancouver Island. So on the east side of the island, sort of. Uh, it was about an hour, hour and a half from Victoria, north. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's so cool. Well, you know, let's, uh, well, let's dive in to give you a, uh, an introduction here. I do a little bit of a prequel, but I always like it better when it's right from the mouth of the individual so that you can tell the story better. And uh, so why don't you tell, um, you know, the listeners about yourself, how you grew up and what kind of got you into the realm that you're in now? All right, man. Well, it's not a very long story, but uh, I guess there's some excitement there. Um, yeah, I went, went to university in Winnipeg. Um, U of M did my kines and uh, an AT degree there. Um, you know, just, lot, just lots of experience had through that. And um, from there, just, you know, personal training. I, I went to work at a couple different gyms um and ended up at focus fitness where where we met and um uh, yeah again just picking up some different skills and and uh it was all pretty much pr pr pretty enjoyable um i kind of got to a point where hey i found like i needed i needed a change i needed I, there was i needed an opportunity for growth so um you know i looked at going back to school and i looked at um i was still running my own personal training business and that was growing and, um, you know, just working out the challenges of, you know, how, how do you make this a career, which is really going through my head. And, and, um, and I think that's a challenge that, that most personal trainers for, for sure, uh, you know, it's gone to their head at one point. Um, and, um, yeah, so just kind of just an internal battle and I ended up taking, uh, or applied for a job in Nanaimo here through the AT, uh, sort of, um, you know, online governing body or whatever. And, um, and I ended up in denial. I didn't even know where it was when I applied. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't even, uh, I'd have to actually look at a map to know where it was. That's why I said it's near the coast. I think right. right now we, on, on a clear day, if you go by the water, you can see Vancouver. Cool. Cool. So, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So it's a cool location and, um, and that's sort of it right in a, in a bit of a nutshell. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and I think uh, that moment that you had there, like looking for something new, and, and I think a lot of trainers have it, a lot of people have it, but trainers, it's inevitable that you're going to have this question unless you 
really understand a good game plan or you get kind of lucky in some regards to get set up with, you know, a team or something like that. And that is such a, like, that's like making it to some form of its own show. Right. And then if you're on a team, then you're traveling. So those are all really challenging things to go after as a trainer or strength coach. Now, with that being said, you were an AT too. So, and we were just talking about this. Um, so athletic therapy itself is really tough. And, and I said the same thing to Jody, where it's like, you know, an AT is fundamentally all the stuff that a kinesiology person takes, a trainer takes, and then harder because it's like all of the extra hours and, and, and then all the injuries and, and you have to know how to treat the injuries. Uh, what was it like going through AT school for you? Yeah, it was good. It was like, it was really demanding. Um, you know, it seems like, it seems like forever ago and it seems like a blur, but um, yeah, between the coursework and working with teams and in the clinic, yeah, I just remember it being like, this is a total overload scenario, but um, yeah, it definitely taught, taught you some good work ethic and you either did it either you know either did it or you didn't and that was that was about it and uh um no man it was but but all, all in all it was good um good. yeah I, I was listening to jody on the other one she said it took her two years to recover and uh i sort of resonated with me and i'm like i think it did yeah it's about something like that so um yeah i was demanding and um yeah. And the, and the sort of the outcome is, is, you know, kind of, I kind of felt like, um, you know, the ATs, we didn't get a lot of respect in the, in the allied health sort of, uh, um, scenario there. Um, when you're thinking of talking to PTs and doctors and, and I was always, I had a chip on my shoulder a bit saying, you know, like, Hey, what about me? Uh, you know, I, I, I can, I, I can help in a sense. Right. And, uh, uh, so that was, that was a real struggle for me. Yeah, it, it is this break in the system that people don't realize. Like, I mean, maybe it's part of the terminology, athletic therapist, that you're just, you seem so classified and it should be muscle therapist or something like that, you know, like um, um, musculoskeletal therapy. Oh, that's a little bit of a tongue twister, maybe. But what you had pointed out, I really, like, this actually drives me insane is like, oh, yeah, but I, I went and saw my doctor about it. I'm like, look, your doctor is going to tell you if you have like a medical problem that they're going to treat with medicine, diseases and stuff like that. But if your shoulder hurts and your back hurts, and if they're not going to do an x-ray on you, go see a physical therapist or an athletic therapist, because it's a, it's a musculoskeletal issue. Right. And you, you've probably seen that a lot before, eh? Yeah. I mean, I mean, a lot of these things need some proper assessment, assessment, you know, to do a proper one, it takes time. And unfortunately, doctors just don't have the time. And, and, you know, I'd say most of them, you know, I mean, they're obviously trained, but, um, you know, it's not their expertise in a sense. It's not what they deal with every day. So um, um, certainly a, an important part of taking care of your body is your doctor. But uh, yeah, certainly these things need some more assessment often. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that a lot. Now, um you know, so you're in the AT and, and you get this opportunity. How hard is that to make that decision? Cause that's a, it's a big life jump, right? You're, you're living in Winnipeg at the time and you, you, you like you say, you're trying to figure out your next move. Um, was that a hard jump? Did you feel good about it? Scary? What was that like? Yeah, no, it was, um, it was a little bit of everything really. Uh, it was sort of a, just put all the chips on red sort of thing. And uh, yeah, I just packed up my car and, my dad went out helped help me out here and um and then it was go it was my first you know nine to five job um you know it was uh yeah it was a bit of a whirlwind for sure certainly some fear involved but you know I think it's I think it's what I needed in, at that time in my life I needed to just do something different and you know um the minus you know I believe I believe I, I think I remember the day I was leaving focus it was minus 55 and my car was plugged in and it still barely started. And I was like, okay, I'm like, I think there's, I, I think there's something else out there. And uh, that was sort of a turning point where I'm just like, just can't do it. Right. Um, so that was a big motivator too, was just better climate. And, uh, and with that comes a different lifestyle too, which was, um, you know, certainly blessed in that, in that respect. Yeah, the, the climate is huge. And I think I still deal with it. 
and it's like one of these things where if you didn't have to deal with it, you'd feel way different about it. And I don't, you, you had asked me this so, so simply. And I said, yeah, I, heard, I was talking about other people moving. And you're like, have you ever heard of someone not enjoying the fact that they moved? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I really haven't. You know, not too many people uh, go to BC or Alberta or most people end up out West and uh, wherever they're at. And they're like, oh man, you know, I, I miss that uh, Manitoba. Yeah, I don't know what they would miss, right? Other than maybe Jets games, the summers can be nice, but summers are nice in a lot of places, and there's other things to do in other cities. So I love my city because of the people, plain and simple, and I just yeah. own that. It's the people. That, and outside of that, you know, you, you have a lot more options in other cities. No, yeah, you're right, and that, that's the best part about Winnipeg is the people, and and both of our families are still there, so we're like we're still totally connected, and um, and we still always go back to see the people, and then that you know we wouldn't change that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, getting into this new city and getting into this new ergonomic job, what was it like starting this whole new field? And and I mean, to me, the ergonomics seems so interesting. I had one guy come in for advanced biomechanics and started to really like analyze, like, whoa, this is a way to really analyze all this stuff and it's important, but what was it like going from, cause you were working with top athletes, right? Pro uh, athletes, yeah. right? Into your everyday worker sitting at a chair, right? Right. right. Yeah. And, and um, when I came here, it was, it was mostly working with, I believe it or not, um, sawmill workers and, um, and Timberlands workers. So anyone from machine operators to um, the guys following the trees and, um, so basically, um, you know, it, it's sort of this industrial ergonomics concept where, um, you know, we're basically, we're basically educating people on body mechanics and, you know, it's the same thing we did teaching someone how to deadlift for the first time. You went through the same steps, right? It's like, Hey, you need a wide stance. You want to hinge at your hips. You don't want to create a new hip joint in your back, right? That's the mechanism of how that stuff wears out and, and Hey, posture is important. So we're breaking it down into sort of some simple, um, you know, simple language, try to get people to care and understand that how you use your body really, um, really is going to dictate on uh, your, your basically, you know, your future function, you know, for, for a lot of people. So it was part, part of the sort of industrial ergonomics concept. And then we did some treatment on site and the whole goal is, you know, can we make a safer workplace? So, you know, it, 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 it obviously different than training pro athletes, which, you know, I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. It was, it was probably, it had to be the best job I, um, I've had. Uh, but it was, the similarities are, are shocking really. So yeah, it, it, it was, it was, a, it was a, you know, it was a cool segue into this, into this career and um, it lent well um, amidst all of the, you know, the challenges of just picking up and going right on a whim. Yeah. And, well, what we had talked about this and it's this idea that um, training has to be so specific when you think about, let's say pro hockey players. And then people are imagining really any way that you can put weights on something and make you do the sport movement. And it's so the opposite, right? It's like, you don't, you don't put dumbbells on your skates and, or put like, you don't practice slap shots off the cable machine. No, it's literally, as you say, it's actually how can you, the same fundamental principle. And we talked about this is like to do no harm. I don't want you to get hurt so you can do your sport. And that's the same ergonomic principles. Like I want you to be able to do this the rest of your life without getting hurt. Right. And, and so what both of those commonalities are don't get hurt and you're a human being and the yeah. human fundamental movements are what need to be understood. So I think that's really um, great how you get to look at that depiction and having that previous experience um, probably lent itself quite well. What were the inherent differences then that you really had to look at that were a bit more specific to it? Um, you know, I just think it's, it's just trying to, when you're working with people in a, in a work environment, they're not all the years, right? They might, you know, for a lot of people, it's like, okay, the company's providing the service and, and you got to find a way to connect with people and find a way to make them care, right? I think that's the biggest one is how, how do I get this person to understand the message and how do they, how do they value it in a sense, right? 
Well, when athletes are coming to you, you don't have to sell them on anything. They're already bought in, right? If they're in the door, they're coming there to work, I would say 90% of the time, right? Or even your, your general public that works with you, right? They're paying the money if they want to be there. So I think it's, um, I think the difference is, um, it's, con- you know, almost maybe convincing is the wrong word, but convincing people that, hey, you know, how you use your body at work is really important. And it, you know, if you want to, you know, we talk about, Hey, you know, what's your retirement look like, you know, um, your functional capacity, like what's that look like if you don't, if you don't take the steps that we should. Right. Um, and then that, that sort of that sawmill and, and, um, um, side it did, it did evolve over time and it was, it was less busy than it, than it was. And then, um, we got a contract with a, um, power company. And basically I was doing the same thing, but public speaking, just talking about basic body mechanics. Um, um, you have these, po- these power line guys there, uh, you know, it's a very physical job. These guys do these jobs for 30 years and, and people wear, people wearing their shoulders out in particular is like, it's a real thing. Right. And it totally changes your life. So um, basically traveled around uh, the province and basically led, you know, conference with, you know, 10 to 40 people and, take people through, you know, what, what is this concept, right? And how, how do we apply it and how, why, and why is it important to you? So, and, and that, that was a real challenging job as well. Um, and that lasted for about a year and then COVID I got laid off and um, I'm here at Island Health now, which has led me to this office ergonomics side of things where I'm, it's, it, it's another different environment and um and then it's, well, I, sh- I guess shouldn't say it's just office ergonomics, but it's working with all, all the health, you know, authority in a sense, which could be nurses and hospitals and it's administrative people in offices. And it's, it's basically applying the same concept and basically, you know, helping them develop this program that, um, and, 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 and sort of the way I try to communicate, it seems to be, it seems to be a bit of a new, I don't want to say new thing, but, um, it, it it, it seems like new information to people. And I'm like, oh man, this is, I mean, you know, it might sound new, but it's just so simple that everyone, I just feel like everyone needs to hear it. Oh yeah. No, I, I love that right there. Everyone needs to hear this. And no matter how um, simplistic it is to you, and it, we were just talking about the mistakes I used to make as a boxer and they were very simple to you, but I couldn't read it. And, and now hindsight, you look at it. It's interesting. I'm in this, um, facebook group uh for planet fitness and so you see these people post questions i'm like you guys still believe these things like you're still believing all of these and then the worst thing is is that they're asking a question and then they're having a bunch of non-experts give them their answers of hey just don't eat carbs or hey just you know do a bunch of cardio or hey you got to do cardio and weights or no weights are useless and it's like and i try to go in there to try to clean up the noise here and there occasionally but it's it's so interesting how what isn't at all new to me, and, and some of these are really old, you know, theories, um, you know, people literally just saying, how do I target belly fat is still the most common question that you see. It's like you can't target it, but it's still not apparent to people. So uh, I, just to come back to the ergonomics, because I think this is so interesting, I'm, I'm really curious about um, what were some of the measures that you would say a laborer, like you were talking more like labor mill, is that correct? So like, was uh, that l- lumber mill, lumber mill, sorry. Yeah. And so, but, and, and I'm, I, I related to this more labor workers. Oh, labor. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Cause that's it's in that you're right. It's lumber mill, but it's, uh, I'm curious about laborers, how you would uh, apply that a bit differently. Is it, was it mainly on body mechanics that they're doing their job or would you have some extra ergonomic practices that like, you know, maybe warming up your body or anything like that, or encouraging certain programs at home to make sure that they could operate well. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. There's definitely sort of like mul- multiple factors. Um, and I, I think that, I think the ergonomics, like this, the term, I mean, it really just means it for a adjust- I mean, it just means adjustability of your workspace, right. To just lessen the human impact. So that, so that's strictly, that's strictly like an engineering piece right where it's using different pieces of equipment or technology or all these different things so um, it's a great buzzword um so yeah a lot of that job really wasn't like technically ergonomics it is it's like here's the workspace how do we use our bodies the best that we can right 
So it's teaching people, you know, you got to prepare your body before you start the day. You know, you're going into a job that involves heavy, heavy forces or high repetition. You know, how do we, how do we account for that from the human perspective? So, you know, here's a warm up in the morning, you know, can you do it before you start, right? Before you go to the gym, you, and you're doing leg day, right? You're rolling out, you're activating your glutes, you're finding some range of motion, you go through the paces, right? It's like, so why wouldn't we approach work the same way? So, um, so, so yeah, it was a warm up piece. It was like, Hey, can I, how can I stretch it out during the day? Um, um, there's the, you know, can I use my tools and equipment better? Right. Like if I'm, if I'm causing myself problems because the, I'm not using something correctly or it's not adjusted for me, how do I understand, how do I understand that better? So I can, I can be in control of sort of how I'm going to position myself. Right. You'd be surprised at how many people just will just plop in, a, in an office chair, for instance, and just not hit a couple triggers and make it comfortable for themselves. If the last person was, you know, six two who sat in it, it's probably not going to be adjusted right for me being short guy. Right. Um, and then last bit is just this basic body mechanics. Like how do I, you know, widen my stance? How do I, you know, create some core, uh, you know, rigidity, give my spine a little bit of support. And how do I practice some good posture? So I'm not, I'm not reaching for everything. And, you know, my head lines up over my shoulders. And, and I think that's probably the, the biggest thing. And the, sometimes the hardest thing for people to grasp is like, because people don't have a coach or a trainer or a mirror for it, you know, to see how they're doing something. A lot of it is just an awareness piece. So yeah. that's, that was sort of the approach. Um, and there's, yeah, and there's a lot to it for it to, for someone to actually take that and use that. Um, but again, it's, it's, um, the, the tr trying to give it in the simplest way. Totally. The, the, the most challenging thing is to make it simple and effective and something you can take home, but there's still going to be nuanced details, right? It's like yeah, yeah. when, when someone asks you about fitness, it's like, yeah, I could give you like the overarching thing, but the details do still matter and to get you to apply it is another thing. So, uh, I, I really like this approach of, of the, the kind of the levels that you describe it. And, you know, I, I always thought of this, even as a, like a, I did labor for construction for a while and I just, you warm up with coffee, right? You just, you show up and then eventually work gets a little tougher and you don't think of, you know, warming anything up or getting your body loose or anything because the job's going to do it anyways. So I think it's a very important concept for people to consider that it's, and it's not like it would take that long, right? You know, most right. prep work shouldn't take that long. So um, with that, let's, I'm really curious with the ergonomics of uh, the workstation. So what, what mistakes do you see people making when it comes to this? Cause you, you see some things like you had, you had alluded to this and I'll call myself out as I'm standing at a standing desk right now. Um, and I have a couple of reasons to do it. it it's not, it doesn't really hurt my back. I actually usually do it just for energy, but what, what kind of ergonomics should people actually be trying to avoid from mistakes? Well, um, I guess it's, it, it, it's hard to maybe put it into maybe like, you know, from top to bottom, but I think, you know, as, as far as importance goes, but, um, I guess the, the biggest mistakes I think people are making, if I'm answering your question, right. I think is, you know, number one, I don't think people are listening to their bodies. I think it's, you know, uh, you know, I'm just going back to sort of the seated office worker, which I'm just focused on mentally at this point. Um, you know, people, they sit at their office all day and I mean, they're, they're not thinking about, Hey, how am I feel? How do I feel today? Like what, what are, what's my neck telling me, right? Is it just telling me pain? Is it pain all the time? Like what, what am I, what am I doing about it? Right. I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, and, and me and my, in my current job, I mean, I'm working with people who are usually in discomfort. It's not much of a preventative approach at this point. Um, it's just it's just looking at the details and saying, okay, what's going on with you, and, and how do we support these people, right? Um, so I think that's number one. Um, I think number two is people don't have a framework to work off of. Like they don't have they don't have a guide to say, okay, I just need to do this, and I and I'm checking all the boxes. Then there's information out there, and there's good and there's bad. Just like strength conditioning, like you said, I mean. If you want to find information, you can find it. Doesn't mean doesn't matter. You know, there's no filter on quality, right? 
Um, so yeah, I would say um, just as far as what are people what people are doing, I would say, you know, I don't know if it's one thing in particular, right? Like uh, as far as you know, people aren't using armrests per se to support their shoulders and neck. Um, I think it's such a combination of things. So if you want to, if we want to break it down, yeah, I mean, um, it, you know, if I'm thinking of basic body mechanics for a deadlift, it's the same concept as sitting, right? I want a good base. I want to use my hip as the hinge joint. I don't want to create a new hinge joint in my back. Right. Um, and if you've listened to any of Stuart McGill's stuff, um, He's got tons of good content on spinal mechanics. He, the guy's the guy's like the leading researcher in the world and mm, Canadian, and and he goes through the disc and sort of the mechanics of uh, of that structure and how forward flexion really is what's sort of beating these structures down, right? Those disc bulges and herniations is from that C curving and creating that hip joint in your back in a sense. So it's really what a lot of it is is about spinal health, and we know okay, sitting's not the best for us and even though it's low effort, right? And there's no real, we think of there's no risk, right? Um, we need to see how that discomfort tends to build, right? So um, it's creating a good base. It's finding a neutral spine, that, that S curve alignment. And then last one is how do I engage my posture, right? Um, sitting is just so heavy on the slouch. Our heads fall forward. I mean, that just, just you know, constant stress and just the, the duration that we, that we tend to spend there our bodies are just having a hard time keeping up. Right. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we just, we just lose our resilience. So you, you hit something right on the head there. I'm super curious about all of that was great. Cause I, I really appreciate the, this idea of sitting into it, hit the hip hinge, like you, you're using your hip, not your back. I love that reference. I hadn't heard that before, but the, the thing I'm super curious about is this posture is like, you know, I, I always wish I had posture, but I'll literally just like, I'll go to have posture and I'll just be like, you know, you just like, it's like, ah, oh, this feels better until it doesn't like, okay, I got to stand up. And it's like, I don't know what's comfortable. I don't even know how to do. So like, um, I know this is probably a, a, a general question that probably has specificity, but how does someone go about improving this posture to have endurance while they're sitting? And I imagine it would have something to do with as you said, some of these fundamental setups, is there any other metrics that or, or you know, concepts that people need to try to utilize to improve this posture so it has the endurance? Right, right. Um, so I'll, I, I have one other thing maybe to add to, to what are the mistakes are people making? And then that'll segue me into the posture thing. I think also equipment, you know, like there is good equipment out there that helps. Hey, I can, I can sit in this, this adjustable piece of, piece of equipment, this chair and there's different keyboards and stuff like that. Um, um, and, th and that's a big help, especially for our like super sedentary nature of these jobs. And, and I mean, co COVID really hasn't helped. Um, everything's on zoom. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, years ago, you know, you'd have to go like if you're in an office, you had to go get mail or go to the photocopier or something. Everything is available on your screen and it's available now. So it's really eliminated this, this, this movement, right? We're just, we, we found a way to, to make movement, you know, expendable in a sense, right? And productivity is up, right? Which is good, but, you know, our bodies don't, they're not responding well. And that seems to be the trend. So if we're talking, like, you know, sim just simple posture, you know, just, you know, when I think of posture, it's, it's I would say it's your body's relaxed state with proper alignment. Right. So pulling me pulling my shoulders back in maybe quote unquote good posture, right? Um, you know, A, it doesn't look comfortable, and B, it's not sustainable, right? So I would say, you know, good posture is A is symmetry, because you know, I think, you know, if you've ever had a shoulder injury, something that's chronic or long term, that shoulder blade doesn't quite hang out on your on your uh, rib cage the same way as your healthy shoulder. Right. So that's number one would be symmetry. And two, I think is, um, you know, it's trying to find that length tension relationship, right? If I've been doing real hard bench and anterior chain for X amount of time for whatever, like maybe some of the classic, maybe gym, gym goers, we get this forward rounded position, right? And that length tension relationship is just off. 
So it's trying to find that again, where we do some pec work, we stretch those pecs, we stop benching two, three times a day <laughs> or whatever. And, you know, we start putting in some more posterior chain work, right? Um, so that, and, and that's what I find a lot of the, the office, the, 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 the basic population needs is more extension, more, more hinge at the hips, more, you know, lunge, like getting that hip into extension um, and just extensor work. So yeah, um, and <clears throat> yeah, maybe a little bit more volume on our rows. That would help fix that anyways. Oh yeah. You know, when you described that, it was funny because you're saying bad shoulders. I was like this. And it's like, then you're saying how the shoulder doesn't sit good in the ribs. And I'm just sitting, I'm just like this right now, you know, uh, I don't, I don't think I have one good shoulder blade on ribs. So I, uh, I, it was funny because I was kind of doing some progress progression photos for, um, I was, it was ended up being just a photo shoot, but I was going to do bodybuilding and checking out my, my progress pics. And I'm like, standing fucking like it, it looks like i got scoliosis <laughs> and it's it's there probably is some spinal issue there from having so, such an offset stance but it, it's seriously like exaggerated and anytime i go to do posing and it, it happened in my bodybuilding show two years ago where it was completely one-sided on the on the, on the shoulders but what I love there, like you say, the, the poles are so important. They're so valuable. And, and like you say, classic gym goer, especially, you know, people are like, oh, the bench, because that's where the bench is at. And, and so then, but like you say, we're already so anterior. So we're yeah. going to have that tightness. And then like, well, no one's excited about the row. Well, how much can you roll, man? When actually, if someone tells me they can roll a lot, I'm like, oh, this is a scary person. Not to mention the people who roll a lot are huge people. <laughs> Like right. they actually look way bigger than someone who tries in probably the person who only does bench won't have good shoulders to do any heavy bench anyways. So more on the ergonomics here. I think this is really good that uh, you're talking about the right equipment. Um, I, and correct me if I'm wrong. There's, there's this ideal hip position um, from the knees to the hip, right? So you, you'd kind of roughly describe this when someone sits in their chair they should be really in a seated position where the feet are flat on the ground. Is the, the hip slightly above the knees or below the knees? You yeah, yeah. The, hip, the hip should be slightly above the knee. Right. It, it, it should be close, but I don't know if there's an ideal like angle or degree, but it should be below at, at or below. If it, if it's any higher, you look funny, but also you do really create shortness in the front of that hip, which is, total classic low back pain trigger for sure. Right. Yeah. I, um, and, and I'm going to tell you my little hack on my low back pain issue. So, uh, when I used to be back at, um, uh, ice flex and focus. So I was doing the Zamboni. And oh, that's I was like, right. <laughs> yes. That was a that's, Zamboni. Uh, I remember that. that man, that's how I worked my way to the gym. I started as a Zamboni and worked my way up and, uh, yeah. And so th this is where I had most of my back pain was from sitting and sitting over into the side and like, you know, I would be hunched over on my left side too, just the way I write and do, you know, highlight research. And then actually on the Zamboni, I would do the same thing. When I f finally got into just studying at home, and I know this isn't perfect, ergo <laughs> this isn't er ergonomically sound, but it was my hack. And what I would do is, and to this day, if I elevate my feet and my, but my feet are rested. And so I actually have my knees are above my hip joints and my hip joint sits back. And what I find about that is that the anterior flexion. So bringing my chest forward and being rounded doesn't have this gravitational force on my low back. Now I feel stiff and I might contribute to tighter hips a bit for sure. But I did find that because of like the deep or the, the, the reclining position, and if, if I have my desk right or like kind of, I have this is a portable desk and I have my computer here, it was enough for my like no low back stress or hardly any. And I mm -hmm. used to get it all the time. So that was my one little hack. What do you think of that? I think you're just displacing stress on your low back and just placing it somewhere else, <laughs> which, which it sounds like. Um, and that's what a lot of people will do, right? You just sort of compensate your way through 
these goofy little things and previous injuries and I mean, and just life, right? Um, and, and people are creative because pain's very motivating, right? You'll, you'll find your way through, but, um, but uh, yeah, you know, a, a, as a young man too, I mean, pretty resilient, right? You're in your early twenties and you're fit. Um, yeah, your body's got tons of capacity to just sort of soak that up and get through it. Just finding, um, you know, there is a point where, you know, that, that recovery rate slows down and <laughs> we really got to look at the details, but, um, I can see where it might've helped you, but I think you just shifted the stress probably to your upper back and shoulders and neck into a little bit of a reach that way. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> now I was like, oh. how do I fix, how do I fix my shoulders and neck? Cause now it's a, it's a matter of, and it didn't bug me for a while. It was more recently. I think once my chair could no longer stabilize because like looking at the ergonomics and in the force that you're talking about makes more sense because just when you had said stacking the spine makes sense because the, the spine is designed to take that force, right? Yeah. And so if we can have the least amount of stress with the least amount of effort, that's ideal so that you're stacking the spine and then it's, you know, gravity is actually already working for you there. And it's finding that, like you had said, the right equipment in the chair that will optimize this. And this chair I found used to be okay with it because I could rest my head, but now I feel like it's deflating a lot and, mm. and I'm starting to notice it more and like all my stress is here. And, and that's even why I find that this standing desk, uh, great for my low back. Um, I actually honestly just like it because it makes me awake and I, rather than just feeling sedentary and sitting, but um, now I'm always looking down. And so there's a, there's a value of where the screen's placed, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So that's where, um, that's where like a really good monitor, like a monitor stand, like an adjustable up down monitor stand would be helpful. Mm -hmm. I can see you're looking down a bit, mm -hmm. um, or a monitor arm, you know, they're, they're reasonably affordable where it can move up with you. Just, you know, it's like two fingers and you can push this thing up because you want that top toolbar to be in line with your eyes. And, um, and two, we talked about your symmetry. I almost see like your left shoulders like poked forward a little bit. And, and as a boxer, right. With, if, if you're, if you're right-handed, that left hand is your jab and your defense and you're throwing it out lots and you almost want to round that shoulder a little bit. Right. Up and up. Yeah. It, right. It's it, right. So it, it's good technical boxing position, but it's bad, you know, um, scapulo, uh, thoracic mechanics, right? When that shoulder gets stuck rounded in that position, um, we tend to see it, it, it's dysfunctional, right? And then funny things like overhead seem to, to, to get a little bit harder. We get some impingement when we sleep. So, you know, um, and then, Hey, if my, if my shoulder blades hanging out to the side, while well, my trap is hanging onto my shoulder blade and connecting up my neck, right? That length tension relationship, you know, it's, it's, it's a universal concept. I mean, the greater the length, the higher the tension. So it's about finding those re relaxed positions um, that are low stress, but still symmetrical. So, so elevate that monitor. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I've been super cheap. Uh, I, yeah, I know, yeah. I know, but the, and, 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 you know, that, that, that's a good point too, is, um, you know, as we get, as our lives become more of this computer thing, it's like, um, you know, and I almost never pictured sort of my work to be so sedentary and like, I'm so much sitting at this computer. I'm like, man, I'm like, what happened? I'm like, I used to be out doing the coolest stuff all the time. Um, although this is cool, but different, but, um, you know, like, like, you know, spending, spending money on, on, on the, on these pieces of equipment, you know, we spend 1500 bucks, two grand on our bed, right. Spend our eight hours, you know, if we're lucky, if we're lucky there, you know, but we'll spend 150 bucks on our chair, but I might be in this chair for eight hours. Right. So why, why, you know, I, if, 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 if that's the demand of my job or that's, you know, if you're, you know, if you're self-employed and that that's where you spend your time, I urge people to like, spend the money on some good quality stuff. And unfortunately, you know, you can't buy it at Costco or Staples. Well, hey, for that. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good segue there to to where to find it. Because um, I did actually go to Staples to look for a chair, and I couldn't yeah, find course. anything. Of course, you did. So where do, where do we go? Is it where do you go? Right, that that's such a tricky spot too. 
um, you know, in, in Nanaimo and sort of this mid Vancouver Island, there's basically one, um, there's one distributor who carries like good quality stuff that really that I know of. Um, so it'd be, you know, it'd be basically like going online and, and basically searching out and ordering or it's finding distributors locally. So it's almost like a niche, little niche market for these things where, you know, like a business would probably have, um, you know, they'd probably have a rep of some sort or office supplier that would supply them. So it's more accessible, but for the average person, you know, they'll say, well, I've been, I went and I bought a $300 chair. It's a good ergonomic chair. And I look at them, I'm like, Ooh, sorry. It's probably not going to cut it. <laughs> However, this person's already suffered some long-term chronic pain for the average person. Might, we might be able to make it work, but um, it's just, uh, yeah, the equipment is just, yeah, it's a little bit more money. About 700 bucks is where that sort of the, the, you know, that quality meets adjustability meets function and, and sort of fits the short person like me and the tall person, right? Yeah. And it's interesting. It's so uh, good that you had said that about the chairs from Staples because I tried every chair and I was just so disappointed in there's even these gamer chairs because they're seen as yeah. like, oh, well, there's a gamer chair. So I'm like, right. They, they literally know these people are sitting in an hour. It's got to be good. And I was like, what is this? This, I couldn't this... take a nap on this. And the one was hilarious because it was the Dark Knight chair. So it was like Batman. And I'm like, okay, this has got to be sweet. And it was one of the worst ones. And it was the most expensive chair in that entire store. And it's just like, uh, it blows me away because I'm like, who designs these? Like, it right. doesn't seem like it has to be crazy for ergonomics. It's like, have some low back support. Like, that's the main thing I could, couldn't find was a good arch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's tricky, right? So um, if people are thinking of, of shopping good, like, good brands, Steelcase is probably the best one. It's made in, it's made in the States. Um, Herman Miller is a good one. Um, and Global. Global is made in Canada. You know, you could probably find a decent one for, you know, 600 bucks. Um, but then again, it, it starts getting awfully complicated because you're, if you're working online, if you can't try these things out. So I, it's always good to try them out if you can find a vendor okay. close to you. So, um, yeah, those would be my, those would be my, my go-tos. I have a Herman Miller and, you know, it should last me 10 years. Yeah. And, and, and I love so, that you put, put the, uh, the, the time to it. I, I even tell people whenever you're, you're hesitant to, to buy something, I say costs per use basis, right? So it's like, because we, we will buy drinks that we have 10 bucks for a drink that you experience for 30 minutes, not even, and, and it's gone. Really? <laughs> and, and if you use your bed for eight hours a night, for five years you're not paying you know 10 cents a, you know a minute right like it's like you had said eight hours in a chair if you have to right and to not be in pain oh well, man that just sounds priceless to me right so right. uh i i really value that a lot i think that's really really great now to, outside of the the equipment or is there any other equipment that you recommend like i think the chair is so vital Having yeah. like a, a monitor at a certain level, is there anything else that you recommend people look at? I mean, you can get super fancy. I I I I, I, I tend not to get overly fancy with some of the like you know the equipment and stuff. You know, it, it gets costly. I think it's if you do the fundamentals right. Um, I I think you've covered most of your bases. The only other thing that I like is a vertical mouse. So I don't have one here, but it just basically set a mousing there. It basically is this way and you basically push and pull and that little laser is on the bottom. I like it. It's super comfortable. If you've got tennis elbow or a bad shoulder, it just tends to really just be a happy position. And it, it just puts you in a more neutral posture. So this whole concept is about neutral postures. Our body's happy when it's aligned. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's just such a, such a simple thing. So I try not to get too fancy with people and just say, use what you have. Hey, let's start by respecting your body, first of all, <laughs> and following some basic fundamentals, right? So just basic feet flat, neutral spine, anchored shoulders, and use armrests if you're using, if you're working for longer durations. Yeah, and, and that's so interesting. A vertical house, never heard of that. I'm even trying to, to imagine using it. They would kind yeah. of get some learning curve 
But I do know a, a, one of my friends who was an AT. He legitimately was work, it ruined his shoulder because he had no impingement issues. He starts working a new job as uh, an, with an insurance adjustment company, and and he's like, man, I I think it's from my mouse because he's just always on there and he's always in front. And it's it's micro stresses that can cause the big long term issue, right? Yeah, it it, it really is. But I, um, yeah, I really like that. So um, when people then are sitting in the chair using their armrests, I'm assuming keyboard kind of right in front of them, is there certain heights and like you say, the least amount of stress, like, you know, I, I, I remember carpal tunnel was, you know, the, the main thing to watch out for back when I even very, very first got started in, in how to keyboard, uh, like how do people avoid that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, again, just, it, just keep thinking, okay, what's my body's position when I'm standing? Like what, what, how, how is, how are things organized? Right? Well, my wrists are in line with my forearm, right? But now I'm sitting. So if I'm bending my elbows, I probably want to support my elbows and unload the weight of my arm, right? Cause I'm static sitting. There's just little, little blood flow moving to my working muscles. I'm asking them to isometrically contract, right? So they're working. Um, so I want to unload my arms. I want my armrests to be in line with my desktop. If I didn't have armrests, what I do is while well, they'd either be down or they wouldn't exist, I would push my keyboard and I'd rest my arms on the desktop. And then I've unloaded my shoulders. So my neck pain should be reduced because now my, my arms don't weigh anything. Anchoring my shoulders and creating a little bit of posture is a little bit easier now because you don't have that downward load. And, and then you just line everything up. So, hey, I've got neutral wrist position. As I start mousing around, do I pin my do I pin my arm and start mousing through my wrist side to side ten thousand times, or do I push and pull my mouse so that I reduce that sort of repetitive stress on somewhat of a fragile joint with the wrist, right? So, sort of as you just think your way through this, you're just thinking, okay, how do I how do I practice some better things for my for my body? Um, just knowing, Hey, we're, 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 um, we're, we're asking our bodies to do more of this stuff <laughs> nowadays yeah. and people are working from home and just, they're using the kitchen table, using what they have. And I'm just seeing, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, people are going to need some help with this stuff. <laughs> it's going to be a problem. Absolutely. And this is really good advice and really like how you talk about the neutral position, setting up the neutral position. It's a good premise. It's like, Hey, how neutral, how much can we make gravity a non-issue and taking stress off the joints and what j joints or muscles can take most of the load right i'm curious from your perspective to just to kind of i know you don't work with them directly or you might in some regards is similar but different is seated positions from like operating vehicles let's say someone drives a lot for their job or um you know they like my dad's a farmer as a tractor is like the, the, that becomes really hard because that's it's a long time in a tractor or in a truck and like you know trying to optimize a car seat probably a lot of the same principles do you, have you experienced working with individuals doing this yeah yeah absolutely um more so working with um sort of the, the, the lumber stuff uh, but it's the same it's the same principles you just got a little bit more of a complex environment right um a lot of those sort of tractors and stuff, some of them are, are surprisingly well-equipped with adjustable features, and then some have none. So it really depends what you're working with. Um, it's, it's the same concept, right? Do I have my feet flat? Can I get some support from that seat and that seat back? Is that seat back gonna help support a neutral spine, right? If it's not, maybe I'm sitting too far away from the controls, right? So it's thinking what adjustable features do I have and how do I match the principle to the task, right? Um, you know, um, so I think it all depends what you're working with. But yes, when you're setting up your car, I mean, it's the same thing. If you're doing the gangster lean and got the one, one arm on the, on the top of the steering wheel, well, we're not in a perfect alignment, you know? Um, if, you're not, you know if you're not driving all day, well, it really does, you know, it's not the hugest importance, right? But it's, it's, the, it's that concept. So, you know, it's bringing the steering wheel they, I would say 90% of them now telescope, right? So it's putting that steering wheel down, bringing it closer to you, reducing that reach. And um, 
And so, yeah, good question, but it's, it's the same concepts. And the, the um, yeah, the, the tractor or the farming equipment would be a perfect example. Um, one, one piece I didn't touch on is, um, is yeah, we got to get moving more. So, so that's a perfect example of someone who, you know, he, your dad or, or yourself, when you're in the, the combine, you might be sitting there for how many hours at a time? Like we're going like four hours at a time. Eight sometimes, you know, if Eight, you're, right. Yeah. It's right. harvest or something. Right. So it's so, so really it's about, it's about creating more movement, right? We're really not designed for this sedentary positioning and lifestyle. Um, it's about, it's about adding more movement and making it a priority. You know, I find, um, I try to tell people 45 minutes is that window where you're going to compensate your way through. You're not, you're not, not really going to know it, right? It's not painful. It's not going to kind of hit your awareness, but we're going to kind of compensate our way through by changing our position, doing the old head kick stand on the, on the table or whatever. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's just funny things, you know, and it, it, um, it's very important to us when we're in this chronic pain state we're like, I need desperately to find out, find some, uh, find some answers. Right. So it's funny when we're, when we're healthy, it's um, you know, it's just one of those things. It's just life. Yeah. When you're healthy and you're actually causing the problem, you're it's, it's irrelevant. And then when it hurts, it's like, Oh man, what's going on here. And, and, and like you had said, it's so important that you, you, you listen to your body. I love how that was your first, instruction for people to recognize because it literally was like yeah i've been feeling this neck too long you know and yeah. and that's that's everyone should be listening to the body you know in any realm of health and not listening to it and like micro traumas as i said are so dangerous because they add up incrementally and it's like this exponential growth of a problem that is so insidious and now it's like what I think is really like the, the root of this is like, not only is it accumulated so much pain and it's, it's formed a habit and structure in your system, right? Your habit of sitting, your habit of exercise or whatever it is, it's like, this is now you and we have to, you know, make this not you. And that's such a, such a challenging thing. So I'm really curious about what, what kind of, and this is hard, I know, when I ask for general questions from a specific problem, but what, what joints and, and exercises, like if you were talking about mobility, should people really be thinking of, like, I know like you had said about the T-spine mobility, what, what kind of main ideas would you encourage people, hey, like, that's an exercise that you should probably be trying to get into? Right. Yeah, I think just it, anything on the extension side of things, you know? I mean, there's, it's a whole giant realm of, of exercises, but uh, certainly I'm not going to go tell, you know, an office worker in middle age to go say, okay, deadlifts is a good idea, which they're, they're probably the best bang for your buck out there for someone trying to get, you know, mass strength power. Right. But um, something hinge related. Right. And again, the deadlifts is, you know, it's a pretty complex movement, especially if you start loading it up, but, um, anything hip extension based kettlebell swing, really good. Keeping it light again, technique would be, you know, important. Um, but yeah, I, I would say kettlebell swing might be on my, on my top of my list. Um, next is, I would say like just heavy rows. I uh, just, for me, I get the same thing, this upper back tension and neck tension sitting too much, but if I just go seated cable row, and get some, you know, work my way up to a decent weight. For some reason, it just cures me every time. And it's almost this instantaneous sort of thing. It's like, oh, it's like instant relief. So I think anything upper back, you know, um, glutes, uh, so that's probably where I would go with. So the average, so that if the average person, maybe not the athlete, but I think they need more extension type, type movements. Yeah, it's funny you say that. It made me think of when I was having those issues and I was like the shoulders or the back more specifically. It was always my um, uh, my front QL that would get really tight on my left side and my shoulders, my back. And if I went for a swim, it would just disappear. And like, right. I mean, not only are you, there, there's some internal rotation from the lats, but I think you are firing a lot of your scapular muscles in order to do that a lot less chest than in like a front crawl and in a big range of motion. So you get this, 
this beautiful lap pump and I think even mid to low traps uh, to actually be like, just turn them on, right? And, and just that simple blood flow. And I think this is what people don't realize about strength is it's like just the fact that it's a stimulus, right? It's like, hey, just remind this muscle to, to shoot some blood in there. It has a job this day. It's a part of your environment and, and, and it's a part of your habitual form, right? And, and sometimes, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is where people don't really realize doing this strength training is corrective training and you do that more routinely and you don't look at it as like i got to get big and strong like the most gym goers would think it's like i got to get out of pain by doing the deadlift or a form of a hinge pattern i got to get out of pain by doing the row because now my body is going to remember that and and then that way it's like when i go to sit down the odds are you stacking yourself the odds are you sitting in the better position is enhanced right Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good point. I tend to see people is just from my observation and it would make sense that, uh, people with good physical fitness, you know, strength, all the, the whole nine yards tend to be more resilient. They tend to be less injured in the workplace, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which would make perfect sense. So it's all about resilience and capacity, right? And it's just unfortunate, you know, the, the longer we spend seated, the less, the less fitness there tends to be. And, um, as we just tend to see the bodies, just, they just don't, they just don't last quite the way they should. So you're totally right. It's, um, uh, it's totally about function. I hate saying function, but I think it's, um, yeah, it's about capacity and resilience on that, on that note too, if I'm going to go exercises, um, so yeah, two, two posterior exercises, um was yeah ke kettlebell cd cable row i like the mcgill big three if you know Stuart mcgill he's got side plank um bird dog or quadruped and then he has a like a partial curl up so it's almost like a crunch but there's no spinal there's not really any spinal flexion so those are awesome for your low back pain sufferers that should be a, a warm-up or a morning routine for for people with the back pain um and then um, mobility, um, you know, I would say a lot of hip, like it'd be hips. Our hips are just stiffening up the more that we sit in these static positions. And so, yeah, hip, hip rotation. I think anything like Kelly Starrett, which, um, you know, he's, he's still, I mean, when, when we were working together, he was sort of an emerging guy. And man, I followed him the whole way through and he's, it, it's, he is so much good content on mobility and 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 how it relates to your sport and your function um so he's a he's a fantastic resource for anyone <laughs> trying to find some mobility and you know super simple so yeah, yeah it'd be it'd be hip 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 range of motion and then maybe some thoracic mobility too some foam roll some simple stuff just a, just a basic maintenance plan and um <clears throat> yeah a, anyone can do that right not all, all the information is like super accessible, but it's putting into practice. Right. It, and, and you basically like look at the joints that are, are getting um, too in, inhibited and in dealing with the stress. Right. So, if it, you know, just look at, okay, well, my hip stays in one position to probably mobilize and maybe into the opposite position. That's why you're saying extension. So uh, to me, it's just a standard for most humans I haven't met too many people. I think I've seen one or two people that generally had very loose hip flexors, but most people have tight hip flexors from the life that we live sitting and just not knowing how to stretch them. So most of our life is going to do that. And then like you say, the T-spine and actually like extension, because it's the opposite of what we're doing when we hunch. Yep. And then, uh, and, and you had mentioned is that the, the thoracic thoracic mobility in the shoulder is getting that rotational pattern down too, so that your shoulders can in, in encourage that mobility. And, and that's what I personally see as well is just like for most people, when you want to loosen something up, like you hit those three and, and you're going to not everything. And that doesn't cure all problems, but a lot of them are there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I also really appreciate what you had said. Um, because you, you had said, uh, you hesitated to say word functional and I yeah. know why, and it's cause it was such a hot word in the fitness industry for a good, I don't know, what was it? Five, 10 years. And now yeah. people are, are, people will still use it 
but we're more cautious with it, I think, because yeah. we went because because how far exercise went. And uh, so, like, you know, before it, it was, you know, just a classic deadlifts and stuff. And then all of a sudden someone's like, well, let's put a barbell on someone's back and put them on the stability ball. Well, it's functional. And like, right. well, but but are they are they in the Cirque du Soleil and they have to balance a 135 pound man on their back? Is that what's functional about it? And so when you start to have these, like, well, because it's so much harder for stability, it's functional. And then, so it just got abused so much. And then when you start to create movements that are just, you, you just get to slap this name functional on it. And I knew what you meant because it's about how the body should function in real life. And it's just the fact that some people kind of took that and ran with it too far. So I think I appreciate where you're coming from with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just another buzzword that just got totally abused. This, yeah, it's, it's definitely so, a pet peeve, that one. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I use it loosely or not so loosely anymore, but always making sure that I uh, try to back up why I'm discussing it as functional. It's, uh, but I'd be curious, is there is there any... Um, how do you feel about standing desks? Because you kind of see you don't have to have standing desks. Are they good or do you see them as bad or can they operate pretty well? Yeah, I, I, I think it's just another tool in the toolbox, right? It doesn't replace good fundamentals for, you know, am I moving frequently? Am I using good body mechanics? And do I have the right tools and equipment to, to support me? Um, it, it, it's one more piece on top of that. I wouldn't put that in the mainstay. Um, I think, um, you know, yeah, yes, sitting, sitting for too long is the problem. And if you can't get up and move and break that up every 30 to, to, to you know, 60 minutes, I would say at the max, um, then you're, you're going to have, you're going to have some problems as a result, right? It depends how they manifest. And some people, like I said, are awfully resilient. Um, and some people at that, that we lose that over time. So, um, I, I like the sit stand desk. It gives you that freedom to work the way that you want. Um, I, I, I talk to people about it every day because I work with, I work with in the large, large organizations so that people are asking about it every day. So I kind of give the same spiel as yes, it's a good tool. Do I recommend it? Yes. Right. But I don't have a $1,200 sit stand desk at my house. Um, you know, one day I might. But I think it's practice the, the easy, the simple stuff that's in your control first, and then add some of the fancy stuff. Um, it seems the most reasonable way to approach it to me. Um, you know, the, some of the re research that came out of the sit-stand desk was, you know, 20 minutes of sitting to 10 minutes of standing. So, so you know, that's the data, right? What that tells me is, okay, you need to move more. It's the static posture that's really hurting us. And if you're sitting with your arms unsupported and your head's like totally forward, well, it should, it, you should feel a little bit more, right? So it's that adjustable feature is good. So is it necessary? No. Is it a good, is it a good feature to, to be able to free that up and work, you know, half, you know, half sitting and standing and, and whatever? Um, yeah, of course. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's sort of the, um, it's definitely the, the extra piece that I think that can make a difference. Uh, it, I really like that you talk about it. Like it's actually, it's not something you need. And I definitely, I, I see it as no matter what you're going to be, you know, static, right. The, the, even when you're standing, you have some static. So like, as I, we talked about my, I'm already looking down. I am getting static issues from a standing desk. The advantage to me is honestly the energy component in my afternoons and it doesn't cause any stress in my low back. So you talked about moving is like in the afternoon, if I get more tired, I tend to work late like this. And so if I get tired, if I'm standing, I won't have that, like I want to go to sleep. If I'm sitting in my recliner position, as I told you, I'm like, I, I just have to close my eyes and I've napped many times like that. So I, um, yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. And I'm curious uh, on like a grand scale, because you've been through this evolution for ergonomics and looking at the body possibly different in some regard. Um, what's something surprising that you learned through these years in this field that you, you, people, most people wouldn't really know or consider, or maybe that even changed your mind? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, what did I not know? 
I think, yeah, you're kind of stumping me. Uh, I would say that, you know, I think what, as, in, as like still feeling like I'm a coach in a sense that people are always looking for, I think, good advice and some quality, quality advice. And, you know, um, being able to like, you know, you actually provide some people with some like, this is like concrete stuff that works, right? And staying away from the fad, the fatties, like, you know, the stuff that are fads that are going to be, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. I think just being able to provide people with good advice is always like, it, it's a, it's a good feeling, you know, that you could actually help people. And, um, and that's really what just motivates me to, you know, be in this sort of, you know, um, you know, it's still pseudo like, like the gym sort of was in a sense where it doesn't, you know, it does feel like a job, I should say, but um, I think it's just being able to, yeah, provide people support and give people good, good recommendations and good advice. I mean, um, people are looking for it and it's good to be a source of quality, <laughs> quality information. And I think that's, I think, um, yeah. And I just keep, I keep working with people who are yeah, in, in, you know, so chronic discomfort, <laughs> when I was working with people who are, you know, chronically looking to be better or bigger or, you know, leaner or whatever, um, people, yeah, they, I, I'm finding just a huge need for people to just sort of, yeah, take care of the body and people in this chronic pain that I, <laughs> that I see. And it's like, oh man, I feel like, uh, yeah, we're still have some work to do. Yeah. And just that overall value of coaching is so powerful. And it's, I still remember the day that I realized that I liked it. And I was initially going to be a construction worker or a carpenter. And that was like, this is so much easier just to express my knowledge that can help someone. And if I could be paid to do that, why not? Right. But totally. I, uh, I really appreciate that. And I think that's a, a really good sentiment there. And um, when it, when it comes to just like the, the one thing that I also do, I wanted to point out earlier that you mentioned is what's really hard is convincing people and as, as rough as that says that like it's worth it like it's worth to make these changes for your life you know and, and you know in the fitness and, and nutrition industry but like for your ergonomics it's like hey look this you got to trust this this has value you got to trust that this can actually decrease your pain and it's going to be uncomfortable for you to do something new getting up every 45 minutes, you know, doing some stretching here and there on your T-spine or hips and like, you know, paying some money for some good equipment, man, it's worth it. Like that's, that's probably one of the biggest obstacles as any coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, try to convince a young, a young person fit and, and uh, you know, strong and athletic, that this is important. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a tough sell. But man, when people are, are, are chronically injured, I mean, it's, um, they're looking, they're looking for the advice and, um, uh, that's trying to get in the preventative side of saying, Hey, yeah, this, you're right. This is important, right. Is have a, have a, have a fitness plan, you know, do, you know, do your compound movements. It doesn't take you that long and, um, and sort of just respecting the body. Right. I'm thinking of like your physical job, right? Like a, a people in a physical job will bend over, pick something up. It's like 300 to 500 times a day. Um, you know, is your, is your, is, is your, is your bottom discs soaking up every piece of flexion and loading your whole torso, every bend? Cause if so, and if you watch any Stuart McGill stuff, which is like totally awesome, you know, that's how he explains. It's like, we, we don't, we don't pick the barbell up the one time and, and herniate our disc. It's 10,000. It's a million bad bends that sort of degenerate this stuff. And then, you know, <clears throat> when we are injured, we sort of feel like we're holding the bag. And, and uh, sometimes I'm a victim of, of this injury, but you know, it's, I think it's just taking some responsibility and for the body and just saying, okay, <laughs> it's my job to treat this thing. Okay. And you alluded to earlier as a coach, you know, your number one job is, is uh, we talked to this, I think off, off camera um, is first not to injure the person, right? <laughs> that's what a good coach is going to really, that's primary. Um, and uh yeah, it's about, you know, it's about avoiding those totally avoidable things. Um, yeah, with, yeah, with good advice <laughs> and trying to be preventative is, is really, is really the win. Yeah. The hardest part is uh, prevent a problem before it seems evident. And when it's a, a human, a homo sapien, 
it's like preventative care is just so like, ahead of us in a sense like because we're instant gratification oriented and so because of that we have a hard time thinking yeah but it's not today right and like you had just said like a young athlete that's healthy or whatever it's like yeah my back doesn't hurt that much it's like oh trust me it will and hey i was that guy like yeah, totally. uh, you, you had said how like um you know being a younger guy when i was 20 and resilient and all those things that's exactly what i was the the, the shit i put my body through was ridiculous and i still remember one day where my construction boss said i can't believe because i i had one of my co-workers not show up to help me move this uh this uh jackhammer and it was huge i had to get out of the basement and, and i even looked back after my injury where my my back was never the same and i looked back was like yeah i don't know how i did that and then again just it wasn't that one pull although that probably stressed it but one day in the gym when i was boxing i could never sit in the chair the same again and it's just like this a, a cumulative stress has such a such a relevance so i think no i think it's a great message i think you you've given some really really solid information here and and i i would like to uh kind of give you a little bit more uh you know information about yourself and because you you seem so passionate about this and even when i was in the gym you know you're a very passionate person what what do you say why do you feel that you're you know, an um, a, a ambitious person, or do you have like an inspiration that kind of led you to, to live this kind of life? Yeah, um, I don't know, Am ambitious, I don't know if I'd say I'm ambitious, but I think it's, I think it's, um, yeah, I just kind of get, you know, sort of obsessive about just certain things. And then I'll just spend my time just reading and trying to learn and, and finding mentors. I know that was, um, you know, um, yeah, just, just guidance, right? People have already done this stuff. So it's like better to talk to these people and learn. Right. And thankfully had, had some good mentors along the way. So, um, yeah, I would say, um, I think it's just sort of being a one track mind, just sort of <laughs> diving in and, and, you know, this sort of this office, this office ergonomic problem that I'm trying to solve and trying to, you know, um, you know, uh, I just educate people on this. It's just sort of my, it's just sort of my flavor of the last couple of years. And it's, um, yeah, just, I think it's, I think it's just sort of getting obsessive a little bit about it. And same thing with strength conditioning. I mean, uh, you know, just sort of live and breathe it basically live in, live in a gym for probably six or seven years of my life. And, uh, it's fun to get to train every day and, uh, yeah, just it's sort of immerse yourself in it. I love that. Yeah. Be, just like you say, just obsess over it. And it was interesting because like I've talked to like Jody was similar. It was like, you don't see yourself as being ambitious, but I do. And based on the experience I've seen with you, I guess it's when someone's not so much focused on creating this label of being ambitious, but they stay involved and directly involved in what they do. And, and it, they are acting ambitiously. It doesn't mean they're trying to be ambitious. They're just that act. And that is who they are by nature. And I think that's really cool. So with that being said, what's on the pipeline here? What's your most recent ambition? Um, well, I'm probably coming up. And I'm just working on how to plan it out. But I'd like to write a book on on sort of just what we're talking about here. And, and uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, just try and give people this information because I feel like like man this is so it's all this office pain and and um and some of this computer related stuff which we're doing more of just seems to be like it's a problem that i'm uh that i'm, I'm looking at and i'm thinking I'm, the solution is so simple right and it's about you know it's uh it's about the concept you talked about and it's and it's nothing fancy but um so yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna start working on that in the winter time and it's a big big project <laughs> um so um that'll be coming down the pipe. And, um, you know, the more that I look into the process of doing that, <laughs> the more I know I need help. So, um, <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, search out the right, uh, support to, to sort of work on that project. So it's in the early development stage. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Keep, that should be great. Posting a year from now. Yeah. Yeah. And like I say, well, uh, we'll have you back on and we'll, we'll dive into the nuances of that. And I'm certain I'll have more questions and 
in uh, how it's going to help people. And we'll see if I actually uh, buy a, a proper standing desk and a new chair by then. Hopefully I keep, you know, I actually listen to your, your great advice, but I really appreciate you coming on today, Nate. This is awesome. So great to catch up with you and to, and to see where you've been going with your business. And, and I think this, I, you know, people listening, listening to a podcast, probably sitting when they do it. So it could be quite helpful. And I, I know so many people in this day and age are sitting and having to deal with this stress. And these are very important topics for people to optimize their health and so they can get out of pain. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it, man. All right. Have a good one. You too. Thank you so much to Nate Rubin. I, uh, I enjoyed that conversation. Generally did because this is something that I get challenged with. And he had talked about it. And I would say 100% agree. I never thought I would be so bound to a computer and a desk and so many jobs are ending up like this and even if you're not at a desk or even if you're not stuck it behind the wheel um, you got to look at the ergonomics of your job and you got to make sure that you're lifting properly and that you're staying out of pain from these micro stresses that we had talked about how we can add up progressively it's not one bad rep it's a million bad reps that can have this stress and if you're spending eight hours to ten hours in a seated position, there's stress going on due to gravity. It's just inevitable. So how you can optimize that is so important. And I was super, super glad to hear that there's a reason why I couldn't find a really effective desk at Staples. So I'm going to be looking up some of those companies myself, and I'll update you how that goes. But I hope this helped you out. I hope you learned some really positive things from this. It's an important thing to consider because if you're having neck pain, you're having some back pain, these issues, and you're sitting at a desk, these are some great things that you can look at to start to get out of pain and think about that cost per use. If you might buy a six to $700 chair, but you use it for five to 10 years, what's the cost per use, right? Per hour, whatever you want to break it down to, it's going to be worth it to keep you out of pain. So I highly recommend that. And, and really, again, go over this episode and really think about some of the things that he had talked about but hope this helped you i hope this is a really helpful one and if you ever want to know more about nutrition exercise or mindset don't forget to check out my website as i always discuss this on my blogs and there's always more information on there and how i can help you with your training nutrition or mindset uh, and you can also check me out on instagram at rq training nutrition so thank you so much for joining today and don't forget, it's not about the pursuit of happiness, it's about the happiness within the pursuit.